po. Hello, may have your picture, please? Okay, so feel free to have your picture still. But, uh, okay, uh, my name is Suman Na. I'm an organizer of this uh, SRS seminar series, SOJC Research Seminar Series. And, uh, uh, we have had uh, a total of five in the winter. And do, 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 do we have the last, <laughs> but uh, at least I guess the speaker Charlie Boyfman uh, coming to this uh, speaker series and uh, share uh, his wonderful uh, you know, story and project. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming Charlie Boyfman. Well, thank you, Sinan. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk to everybody, and thanks for coming. In. Please get up and eat pizza because it smells too good right here. Um, so, you know, my title of my presentation is called Preamble, and hopefully you'll all get the why in a second. Uh, the Making of a Narrative Story. Uh, this is about a piece that ran in Runner's World magazine in November um, that I had written uh, with the help of actually a number of people in this room. So um, I'll tell you more about that as we go along. Um, just, just for some background, so, th you know, I know this is sort of a research type discussion. Um, I'm just going to give you some of my tools that I worked with, and I'll, I'll get into them more as we go along. But basically, interviews with primary sources, and as a journalist, we're always looking for really good uh, primary sources. Um, artifacts, letters, and other writings produced by the primary subject of this article, um, which helped to bring them back to life. So as you'll, as you'll discover, the story is about someone who, um, up till almost when I started reporting, um, had been a very vibrant person here in the Eugene area. Um, as I got to reporting, though, I, I realized he had passed away. Um, which made the story both um, challenging but also brought out a lot of really um, cool stories. Um, and finally, uh, material exclusively housed in the University of Oregon's Night Library. Um, so again, we'll talk about that in, in a few minutes. Uh, just about me, so yeah, I'm an instructor here in journalism at the school, of, at the SOJC. Uh, I've been here, it's my third year, full-time teacher, but most of my career has been in magazine work. Um, you know, these are just the places I've been through basically since I got out of college. Um, I kind of alternated between business magazines and sports magazines and business magazines and sports and finally got to Runner's World magazine. And um, in a way that was a, a dream job, um, dream part two, because my dream was to work for Sports Illustrated. And right out of college that was like the place I wanted to be and a lot of my friends did as well. And um, I kept applying and applying and I kept getting rejected and rejected. Um, finally I figured this ain't working out. Uh, I did the next best thing. I, I married somebody who worked in Sports Illustrated. So, um, you know, if you gotta, you gotta find your way. And, um, but Runner's World turned out to be a really great second chance because um, at the time, I, I was brought on just as the magazine was evolving. Um, it had been, you know, around for, at that time, just about 38 years. And it had been the Bible of running in, in many ways, but it had been very, you know, dedicated towards how do you get to be a better runner? How do you get to be a better marathoner? How do you, how do you lose weight through running? How do you take your 5K time and make it a, 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 a better than your, your next door neighbors? Um, they wanted to bring more storytelling to the magazine and make it not just short pieces, really long narratives. So in, pre, before I got there, the magazine, the typical magazine piece might be 2,000 words. We grew it to 4,000, 6,000, 10,000 words sometimes. So we were competing with the New Yorker, Esquire, GQ, at least in our minds for telling really good stories. So, um, you know, Runner's World has a great history. It's been around since the late, uh, late, late 60s. You know, it's covered everything from the earliest of the running booms through Oprah's run through the marathon, um, through, you know, 2013 when Boston was hit with, the, you know, the tragedy of the, the bombing there. So it's seen a lot of stories throughout the years. Um, but again, it was, my, it was my dream to work there um, because I love sports. And you know, I've been to some of the best facilities in the world, or some of the funnest facilities. Uh, from the earliest Yankee Stadium to the renovated Yankee Stadium to the current Yankee Stadium. Um, you know, Fenway Park, Wrigley Field, Dodger Stadium. Notre Dame, if you've been to Notre Dame, you've got to go to a football game once in your life at Notre Dame, even though if you're not even a Notre Dame fan, you want to go. Uh, the Big House at Michigan, Madison Square Garden. Um, I grew up a Knicks fan. Um, sorry to see where they are today, because the garden, when, it's, when the Knicks are playing and playing well, is, is really, it is Mecca. Um, so, you know, I really got fortunate to visit a lot of sporting facilities through either my own passion for sports or through my journalistic work. Um, but one place I always wanted to go to was this place, Eugene, and, you know, Track Town. And in 2012, um, myself and about seven other Runners World people 
came out to cover the, the Olympic trials. And um, it was everything that kind of you know, in my mind's eye was built up to be. You know, it's just a great facility. Um, it, is, it is iconic in so many ways. Um, you know, if you're a baseball fan, you do love Fenway Park, even if you hate the Red Sox. Um, same thing those other places I mentioned. They are, they are they're, they're, they're must places to visit. But so is Hayward Field. Um, and I got here and I was like, wow, this, this is cool. And, but I, you know, a lot of it was bought into what the history of this place is. And if you're familiar with you know, running and track and field in Eugene, you know, it starts way before the current team, which is really, really good. I mean, it goes back to the 20s. And it starts with you know, you know, Bill Bowerman. And it goes through, uh, actually, uh, Bill Hayward and then Bill Bowerman and Bill Dellinger. And along the way, you got guys like um, Kenny Moore, who, um, if you know anything about great sports journalism, Kenny Moore is right here from Eugene. Um, and he, he made it to two Olympic marathons. And he wrote for Sports Illustrated. And then he wrote for Runner's World. Um, he's just an incredible person to know that he, he grew up here. Um, so it's all that. It's Galen Rupp, who came you know, decades later. It's the current women's team, which you know, did an amazing thing last year, winning three NCAA titles in one year. Um, so it's all that. But it's also something else. Anybody know who this is? Steve. Steve. Um, and that's Pre. And that's more Pre. Steve Prefontaine, who, um, you know, I don't have to tell it to some folks here. Um, he was the, the, the Mickey Mantle of Eugene, of maybe America in the late 60s and 70s. He was Joe Namath. Um, he was, um, you know, Michael Jordan, before Michael, there was a Michael Jordan in some ways. Uh, he was uh, Derek Jeter. Um, Derek Jeter was, you know, for so many kids today, Derek Jeter was their first hero. Um, for a lot of people, Steve Prefontaine was the hero, um, the person everybody wanted to be like. Um, he ran fast. He ran in front. Um, I guess he was good looking, too. Um, you know, he, had, he, in a way, had it all. Um, and he, he was special. Um, you know, he's also incredibly quotable. And this quote gets picked up all the time, but it, you know, it does because it says a lot about who he is. Somebody may beat me, but they're going to have to bleed to do it. Uh, Steve Prefontaine, January 25th, 1951 to May 30th, 1975. Um, just for a moment, I want to give you a little taste. If, if you don't know Steve well, here's just a little taste of what he does or what he did. He came here to build his fighter step by step, stride by stride, breath after scorching breath, always faster, hotter, higher. We can't even feel that fighter. They just have that, whatever that is, I don't know. Actors have it, singers have it, some people have it, some people don't. Most people don't. He had a lot of it. He was the benchmark that we all tried to, you know, measure ourselves against. He was so ferociously competitive in the sport. He understood that he was getting close to the limits in ways that few people do. Of all the great athletes that have worn our products on the field of battle, you know, we've made a statue of only one of them. That was Steve Prefontaine. To us, he was pre. It was more than a name. It was a condition, a fanfare, a heralding of something beyond winning, above the sport, off the track. Pre. 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 No one saw him ever forgot it. Arms and legs pumping out of that last turn, lips pulled back, eyes shooting up the scoreboard clock. Not at the finish line, at the time. Free, free, free. He held all seven American records from two to 10,000 meters. At 21, he challenged the world in one of the greatest Olympic races of all time, and later turned down a fortune for a shot at the world record. The story goes that he told the race promoter to keep it. I run best when I run free. Free never made it to that race. This morning, one of America's finest assistant runners, Keith Prefontaine, was killed in an automobile accident in UP Road. He died a little more than four hours after he had run the second. Um, just a little taste of Free from a documentary that was done back in the mid-90s. Um, 
You have a chance. There's more and more about Pre than you ever want to look at. Um, two movies came out almost like month after, uh, to back to back, um, almost now uh, two decades ago. Both good. One's better than the other. I always forget which one's better. Um, um, but they're really they're good. They're good looks. He's used you know today, 40 years after his death, in um, ads. That quote that I mentioned a couple of minutes ago shows up a lot. Um, the Prefontaine classic comes around every year. Um, and he's even been on bobbleheads. You know, Pre doesn't die, in a sense. He lives on. Um, this is a former student of mine at Lehigh University um, who also ran on the cross country team. Then she got a job, a dream job at Runner's World. Um, but she showed me her blog one day, and she had written this. Uh, because I was born nearly 20 years after his death, Pre has always been quite literally the stuff of legends. Like any other runner, I know his most famous quotes by heart. And yes, I was one of those geeks that had a poster of him in my dorm room at, at college. So that's her dorm room, and there's the poster. Um, you know, again, she's, she was born 20 years after him, but I think if you go into any high school kids, you know, if you're a runner and you're a high school runner these days, somebody's got his poster up there. Uh, it's just amazing, the, the legend of Pre. Um, books have been written about him multiple times. Um, again, I mentioned Kenny Moore. Kenny Moore came out with a book now about 15 years ago on Bill Bowerman and the men of Oregon. And it's a great like, history of, of Oregon and, and Bowerman. It's also a history of Pre and a lot of his, his teammates, um, including Kenny himself. Um, as I mentioned, Kenny turned out to be one of the best writers ever at Sports Illustrated. But before he got there, he ran both the 68 and 72 Olympic marathon. And in 72, uh, Kenny runs the marathon days after the um, tragedy where um, you know, Israeli uh, athletes were, were killed. Um, Kenny had to go out and do the marathon. He, had, he thought he had a chance to win it that year. He ends up finishing fourth. Right after the race, he meets Pre. And this is right after Pre had, uh, had his amazing 5,000 race, which he doesn't win, but as we find out what happens. Um, Pre Fontaine saw me in the tunnel and ran over. Kenny, you've got to be proud, he said. Out of all the billions of people in the world, you were fourth. I order you to be proud. I realized this race was over. Pre, what did you get? I got blankety blank fourth, man. It's the worst place you can ever finish. Uh, <laughs> You know, that's Kenny, and it's also Pre. Uh, he just never, he never accepted finishing beyond uh, first. Um, he starts showing up on magazine covers as early as 1970, when he's, a, I guess, a, sophomore, a freshman here at Oregon. Um, lives on. In 19, uh, 2009, we had him on the cover of our issue. Um, we talked about the best of running, and Pre was our cover, cover image. Um, and we told the story about him again there. Four years later, we told it again. Um, I, had, I had been just again, this is 2013, it's a year and chain, or almost a year to when I'd been out here for the trials. And when I was here, I just noticed the, 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 this affection for Pre. You go into the duck store, you saw the Pre stop t shirts. You, you, you get off the plane, you, you, dr you drive into Eugene, you see Pre almost immediately got there. And um, so I asked this writer, Michael Heels, like, investigate, what was the, what's the culture here? Why do people continue to, to like, bow to Pre? And he wrote a really amazing piece. Um, where he's an Oregon guy and what he, why, why he followed Pre. So there was, there's something there this guy gets written about. Um, written about so much, he wonder if anything could ever be written again. And then I went into a bar one night um, where all good stories often start. Um, don't, don't listen. <laughs> um, but I went in with uh, Tom McDonald, who's a professor of advertising here. And um, we went into Rennie's, which is right around the corner here. And Tom had invited me with a bunch of his old friends to go to the Prefontaine Classic that night. Um, but Tom, if you don't know, was a, a really good runner both in high school. Then he went to Lane Community College, ran a couple of years there. Um, gets to U of O, and I think he'll tell you he didn't run too well. But he, you know, I, basically it was JV, which is pretty darn good in the mid-70s to be to running, you know, the U of O team. So we get there, and we're, we're having a couple of, uh, what are these, what's the specialty there, tater tots? Um, tater tots keep coming, but so do the stories. And for about an hour and a half, Tom and his buddies are just telling you know, war stories about their running days. Until almost we, got to, we have to leave. And um, I forget who it was, but they start talking about a guy named John Miller. And they wanted to know, how's John doing? Um, and I said, who's this John Miller? Oh, you don't know the story of John Miller. I said, I've never heard of John Miller in my life. Well, John Miller's the guy who put that little statue on Pree's Rock. I said, really? What are you talking about? Um, you know, you go to Pree's Rock. This is a photo of John. But he explained, you go to Pree's Rock, and how many of you have been to Pree's Rock? 
Okay? Um, you go to Prees Rock on a normal day, and this is you know, right up on Skyline Boulevard, not far from here. This is where the spot that Pree had his um, car accident that ultimately killed him. But every day you go up there and there's going to be memorabilia that people have left uh, in homage to, to Pre. There's t-shirts, there's caps, there's running shoes, there's medals. Anything you, that you know, running fans have to offer, they offer it up to Pre at this rock. Um, you know, it, usually, I think it's more in the summer, but if, um, every six weeks or so, somebody comes by from the city of Eugene and kind of cleans it up, and then the next day it all starts again. Um, it's an incredible cycle. So you go there and it's you know, really easy to kind of get, get lost in all this stuff. Um, little you know, letters are, are left for Steve um, from kids today. Um, and then if you look kind of closely though, right up there in the left hand corner, you know, right there, right there is um, an image of Steve Prefontaine um, that as it turns out, Tom McDonald's friend and friend of a lot of guys at that uh, dinner that night, um, he's the guy who put it up there. And you know, I got curious. And I said, you know, I just said, who's this guy, John Miller? And why the heck did he put a pre on Pre's Rock? Um, and um, you know, it, 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 you just you know, the instinct of a journalist, you're like, what, what's going on here? Um, so that, that was the beginning of my kind of pursuit of this story. Um, life gets in the way sometimes. And a year went by, I, you know, career stuff gets in the way, family stuff gets in the way, um, other stuff gets in the way. So I don't pursue this story until the following June when uh, Runner's World is again covering the 2016 Olympic trials. And this time my wife is at Eugene covering it and uh, she's sort of the editor of the section. And I say, hey, let me do a quick story on this guy, John Miller. Maybe people would want to go see Pree's Rock. Um, so I get in touch so with my, I begin pursuing my primary sources. Um, and I get in touch with Tom McDonald. I haven't spoken to almost in a year. Um, and I say, Tom, kind of looking into the story, you know, I'd like to talk to you more about your friend. And I couldn't even remember the guy's name. And Tom, you know, we got on the phone and we talked for an hour. And after I got off the phone, I said, I can't do this this quickly. Um, Tom was just giving me so much stuff. But the, the most tragic part of it was that um, he, he mentioned that John had passed away in the interceding 12 months. That, um, they had mentioned he, he wasn't feeling well at that dinner. Um, I didn't know how serious it was. Maybe a lot of people didn't know, but John passed away uh, the following uh, September. Um, so just four months after our dinner. Um, but getting off the phone with Tom, I said, wow, there's still a story here um, about who this person was. Uh, but again, time goes by, um, and I gotta get more names. Tom's just one source, and Tom's memory is foggy. You know, Tom ran with them in the, in the mid-70s. It's now 2015, um, so I gotta get more sources. So, um, one of the sources, I looked up John's um, obituary, and not a big write-up, you know, sort of a, you know, John was like a lot of us, just a regular Joe going to work every day and had a family. Um, but if you read real closely, there's a line that says, John was an avid Prefontaine fan and sculpted a bronze statue in honor of Steve, which still resides today on Pree's Rock, which confirmed that um, what Tom had been telling me. And it, According to Tom, very, very few people knew about this statue. Uh, the person, John and one other person went up that day to, to nail it into the rock. And they kind of kept it to themselves. Um, they didn't want it known. They didn't want to get in trouble, I don't think, either. Um, we'll have to ask that person uh, whenever we meet them. Um, but you know, it was, they, you know, they basically took a, a piece of public property and knocked a rock into it. Um, but here's proof, in some form, that John Miller was the guy who put that up there. Um, so, you know, the interest gets going. So I, talk, I start, you know, calling around. Tom, and uh, the uh, one guy, Mike Freeton, who, who ran with John in the high school, and, you know, we connected. He gave me some more information. Um, but time keeps passing, because I'm not, I got other things to do, and this is a tricky story. Um, finally, though, I, I, people keep telling me, you got to talk to two people. And you really want to get this going. You got to talk to a guy named Tim Lewis, and you got to talk to John's wife uh, and, you know, widow, uh, Rochelle. Um, so I start you know, trying my best and I finally get Rochelle. Um, she had been busy and maybe she was still kind of in mourning. But when she did get back to me, um, she was great. We, we met down, she lives in Creswell, and I went down there one night just kind of, just to get to know each other. And we talked for about an hour. Um, her son was there and he was kind of quiet. Um, but we talked and Rochelle gave me some good stuff about John, about his life. Uh, also showed me a lot of stuff, which I'll, I'll show you in a minute. Um, and then she I said, can you help me out with some more names? And she said, sure, um, give me some time. And a couple of days passed, and I said, you know, basically emailed me, sorry, I apologize, I got busy. But suddenly, 
my two sources in three became seven or eight. And that multiplied to like dozens. Because um, this guy, John Miller, whoever the heck he was, knew a lot of people. And the connections were, were starting to form uh, from his high school, um, from his uh, college, from his work, um, to his family. Um, it was kind of cool to see all these people like come to life. Um, so, so I started talking to those people. And like say, an image still somewhat blurry of John Miller was emerging. Um, it was just all these little threads. And here's some of the threads. From his high school friends and teammates, I learned how he used to echo the words of pre during hard workouts. So it turns out John wasn't the, like, if you, I think if you met him, and again, I never did, but he wasn't really built as a runner. Kind of a bulky guy, but he loved it, and he loved pre. And he was living in this era, in this age, when pre was the man. So he wanted, like, to away, be pre. That did a lot of people, but for some reason, John Miller wanted to do it even more better than others. So we'd talk in workouts about we got to run like Pre does. Um, from his sister Juanita, uh, I learned how their parents fueled John's early interest in drawing and sculpting with the Christmas presents they gave him. Juanita also told me how John reacted when he first heard the news of Pre's death. From his old high school girlfriend, I learned about the early morning runs John, John used to go on, the first of two workouts he would do most days. So John would get out of bed, run to his girlfriend's house, who turned out to be an incredible runner who ran for the OVO team, uh, back in the mid-70s. Um, they'd then go on a run. He'd drop her off. He'd go home and shower, go to school, and then go for another run. Um, he, he just had this crazy workout routine. Um, from his brother Don, who's right in the corner there, um, I learned about their father and the long hauls he used to make as a part of his job as a truck driver, uh, but also how he tried to get home in time for John's cross-country meets. So there always seemed to be this line of like family in John's life, and, you know, family running, being together. Um, and then finally, from his ex-wife Amy, I learned about the conversations they would have about Pre during meets at Hayward Field and the affection for Pre that they never died. So Amy was not a runner from what I kind of learned. But they got married, and then they used to go to Hayward Field for the meets, and John would sit there and tell all these stories and make Amy laugh about Steve and their, their, their hijinks as runners. Um, so it was all kind of like forming. Um, so a picture came together, and this is from the story. John Miller, in his tiny bedroom above the garage of his parents' house on BB Lane, on the northwest side of Eugene, had photos of Pre taped to his wall, right next to the post of Rockwell Welch in one million years BC. From his local newspaper, The Register Guard, he cut out a photo of Pre in stride and pasted it to the cover of his homemade running diary. When he was older, he would even grow a mustache that looked a lot like Pre's. And whenever Pre raced at Hayward, Miller and his teammates would be there. They all wanted to be like Pre, but Miller seemed to want it more. John idolized Pre, says Tom McDonald, a teammate of Miller's both at Lane Community College and later at the U of O. It was, he says, hero wish worship. So if you don't remember what Tom McDonald looks like, that's Tom from a few years back. Um, so that was the beginning of this, the process. Here's uh, part two. This is where a lot of help came in from, from people who gave me stuff. You know, Rochelle, God bless her. Um, I went back to her house for another interview, and she pulled out his diary, John's diary, um, for four years, from his sophomore year through his first year and a half at Lane Community College, John wrote down virtually every workout he did, and little notes about what it felt like that day, or what it was going through his head, or, or if he had, you know, chicken pox that day. Um, and it was an incredible resource. Uh, it's just, you know, you felt bad, but it was also fun to read. Um, you know, those are the, some of the notes. Um, John, there were newspaper clips. Not a lot, but John was pretty good. Um, he finished his fifth in the uh, in his senior year at, in, in high school in the state championships. Um, he also writes a letter. Um, he and Amy were having trouble having a, conceiving a child. And so they're looking to adopt. And there was this letter that John writes about um, himself that Rochelle had, and she let me borrow it. Um, John also wrote a letter to his son um, in sort of the, his dying days of things that he wanted to tell his son that he never would. And again, you know, his son was really um, beautiful to let me read this letter and also to use it. So I was getting some, some more background information. Um, and also saw the original statue. Um, you know, Rochelle had this. And this is a statue that um, Tom McDonald first saw back in 1975 um, it, that John did, John sculpted. And they had it in their, their sort of you know, bedroom apartment here in Eugene. And wherever John went, this went with him. And it always had a place sort of of honor on his, in his house. Um, so that was the sculpture. And it, it was cool to see. But as later on, I found out it was kind of also confusing. But that's, that's, that's the cast. Uh, so more from the, from, the, from the piece. In many ways, the two were alike. 
Prefontaine came from a blue-collar family in Coos Bay. His dad a welder and carpenter, his mother a seamstress. Miller's dad, Harold, was a truck driver who delivered everything from diesel oil to Coca-Cola on routes around Oregon. His mom, Marjorie, worked as a school cook. They raised four kids, born over a 17-year stretch. The oldest was Don, who left the house in 17 to enlist in the U.S. Army during the early days of the Vietnam War. John, born in 1955, was only nine at the time. Life was largely idyllic. Harold and Marjorie always made sure John's Christmas pile included sketch paper and charcoal pencils, tools for his budding artistic hobby. And whenever he was off the road, Harold caught his son's cross-country and track meets, the ones he missed Marjorie filmed at the family's 8mm camera. Quote, I was to learn that being a truck driver was a good, honest way to provide for your family, Miller once wrote in a letter. My mother always rose before Dad to make him breakfast and sent him out, to do out the door with a kiss and a, and a lunch. Um, again, I never got a chance to talk to John. Uh, you know, for obvious reasons, but you know the the, the beauty of having that kind of art, artifacts to to look through, I got to hear his voice and um, you know bring it into the piece. Um, a little bit more from the piece. This is um, John as a runner. He pushed his teammates in the same way. His high school coach, Mike Manley, was notorious for punishing workouts with serious mileage. Tim O'Malley, a year behind Miller, remembers seeing a, a Manley workout and wanting to hide. Us lesson runners would be complaining, this is going to be a killer. Then John would come in whistling and get his clothes on and stretch and say, tough workout, guys. Let's get going. He'd flip the hood on, his on and head out. Naturally, you followed him. And if anyone began hurting during a run, Miller would pry. What would Pre be doing now? It locked everyone back in stride. And then finally, the early morning runs, the extra miles, the leadership seemed to pay off. On November 10, 1973, Miller, in his final high school cross-country race, led North Eugene to a third-place finish at the state championships. Individually, he placed fifth, clocking at 12 minutes, 11 seconds, over 2.5 miles. But fifth wasn't good enough, not for someone whose hero once said, somebody may be, be so, but they are going to have to bleed to do it. That night, Miller wrote in his running diary, today was my last cross-country race for North Eugene High. I placed a disappointing fifth. I guess I should be happy. I missed fourth by one second. Um, it sounds like somebody we know. Um, Turning to like research tool number three, um, Night Library. Everybody hopefully is familiar with this place. Um, <laughs> it's a spectacular place. Um, so shortly after Pre dies, um, John has an aha moment. As he, as he kind of picked up, he was a pretty good runner, but also a pretty good artist. Um, he was running at Lane Community College, and um, he decides to you know, honor his hero by making a sculpture of Pre. And he does it over a course of nine or 10 months. Um, again, Juanita, his sister, filled me in on how he did it, um, to the point where he was actually using the, the home stove to like, make this thing work, um, which was incredible. Um, you know, it was great, to, you know, Juanita and her memories. Um, the trick was I was getting a lot of good information, but I was trying to verify it all and getting get secondary source or third source to like, make sure I had it right. Um, and just, just as we're, I'm done, you know, I write, here's a graph. So this is a graph from the original draft of the story, not the completed piece. Days later, Miller and his Lane teammate were at an end of year banquet. As the dinner was wrapping up, a memorial service for Pre was beginning at Hayward, Hayward Field, three blocks from the restaurant. As soon as their dinner ended, Miller and his teammates sprinted to Hayward to hear Bill Bowerman say of his champion runner, Pre was stubborn. He insisted on holding himself to a higher standard than victory. A race is a work of art, that's what he said. That's what he believed, and he was out to make it one, one every step of the way. And it was like a perfect, perfect quote. You know, it just made that you know, work of art that's gonna transit, for me as a writer, I'm gonna transition that into making a piece of art. It is so perfect. And everybody said, Bowerman was the last speaker, and he said those words, and then it all drifted into, you know, if you're making a movie, it drifts into the next scene. And I'm like, sweet, I got it, I'm done. Then you got to fact check your story before it goes to, to print. Because if you don't, you're going to leave some mistakes in there. Um, and so I have it there, and I've Googled it, and I find this quote. But I'm finding it mostly because it's in one of the pre-movies. And I, um, I'm like, all right, well, you know, I'm sure it's got to be right there. I'm not just scooting around with the, the movie. So I keep looking and looking, and I said, ah, how am I going to verify this? And suddenly my editor's saying, you know, we got to close pretty soon. we got to go to press. You know, is this thing done? Um, and this is in the middle of summer, you know, late summer, and I'm looking around, how am I going to verify this? And I go over here, and I make one stop first up into the university archives, where if you are ever bored, go here. Um, it's just it's a magical place of stuff. 
And um, last year, I think it was OPB, or no, I think it was C-SPAN, did a piece on this part of the university. And they did it on the Bowerman collection of material. Um, so I got in there, and I swear, I think I got there just as it opened, because they do a lot of scanning to get you in there. So it was about 10 o'clock. By 10.35, I had a letter from Bill Bowerman. It's basically his eulogy from that night. And I'm so glad I did, because what I had in the, in the, the piece was wrong. Um, Bowerman had different words that day. Um, and this piece of paper at least got me there. Um, but I also had in my mind, because somebody told me that it was um, Bowerman who spoke last at that memorial service. There were three key people at that, that service. It was Bowerman, um, Kenny Moore, and Frank Shorter, who had won the 72 marathon. And they were good friends. And they were actually all with Pre the night he died. Um, and they had all, you know, the, my sources had said, Bowerman was last, and then the clock closes on Hayward Field and, again, fades to black. Ah, it was itching me. I didn't know, was that legit? So then somebody said, you've got to contact one more person. And that's Elizabeth sitting right next to Jesse here. And I, I, it was amazing. I think it was 1040, um, and I contacted Elizabeth Peterson. And I don't, I don't want to, I'm, I'm going to exaggerate for effect, but it seemed like about five minutes later, um, Elizabeth <coughs> had what I needed. Um, she, if you don't know, there is an incredible collection of, and Elizabeth, you can talk better to than me, but there's a, just an incredible collection of, of archival footage of, of things up in the library, including a collection from KEZI, the, the ABC affiliate here. Um, and a few years back, they just gave it to Elizabeth and her friends to go, go have fun with it. Um, and so Elizabeth, within, you know, I, I exaggerate, it was probably within an hour, um, sent me this link. That's Bill Bowman. Frank Shorter. Um, so thanks to Elizabeth, I was at least able to verify that Bill Bowerman was not the third speaker that day. He was number one. Um, and it didn't work out well in this piece to put that because it wasn't as dramatic. But at least in my head, um, I was in it saved by, by that. So um, again, that, that really came through. Um, so this is what happened. My original piece changes to this. <coughs> So a different quote, and this is how the quote is, memory of our last great champion will live in his charge to the finish line, his runs through his hills and dales, truly is part of the Hayward heritage. Um, it didn't have the same little thing that I wanted, that little connection to art, but it worked fine, and we, we transitioned fine throughout. Um, so that's the research part, and I think you guys were promised what the secret was. Uh, I'm going to finish this up with the secret. What's the secret behind the statue? Um, this is what I originally saw. And for a long time, I just couldn't figure out, how did that become that little, that little statue that appears on, on, the, on the rock? Um, Tom McDonald had theories, and everybody else did. And I couldn't figure it out. Um, you know, I talked to so many people, they just couldn't figure out how that became this. Because that's all anybody ever remembered. Um, you know, as it turns out, John um, and Amy split up in you know, the 90, 91 era. Um, and from Everybody I talked to it seemed like John was going through a pretty blue period. Um, and this is sort of conjecture, sort of speculation, but it seemed like in that period, John had not much to do. A lot of his friends were married with kids, and he didn't have any kids. Um, his job was fine, he was, but he's OK. Um, his marriage is dissolving. So what we kind of speculated was that he started sculpting another pre based on this cast. And what he did, he built it and put little spikes on it. And he had, he had a plan in mind. 
but he needed um, a co-partner in all this. Tim Lewis, who's right here. Um, <laughs> um, you know, as, as I was really fortunate, I mentioned, you know, Rochelle was a huge help in doing this piece. Um, Don was a huge help, Juanita. Um, Tim, you know, filled in a lot, a lot of blanks because Tim and John were best buddies from basically seventh grade um, through high school. Um, you know, then they, you know, they, I don't think I'm telling any secrets here. Tim and John just went separate ways for a while. They just career paths. Um, but they always, you know, were connected, running. These guys ran like crazy together. Um, I think they ran in more ways than running, too, if you, if you get what I'm saying. Um, they had a good time. Um, they were good, good buddies. Um, I'll just go back for a minute. Um, but in this blue period of John's, you know, somebody out of the blue shows up on his doorstep, and it's Tim Lewis. And um, Tim needs a place to stay for, for a while. Um, and, you know, John opens the door. And they're, they're having, you know, back to, it's like 1972 all again, you know, friends and telling stories. And then one day, uh, John says to Tim, you know, I want to do something. And he goes, what do you want to do? Um, well, I want to put Pree's statue in Pree's rock. And Tim probably said, sure, sounds good. Um, so one day before uh, they do it, John goes up to Pree's rock and surreptitiously drills a couple of holes in Pree's rock. Um, then they hatch the plan. They're going to come back a couple of days later um, when everybody else is at work and put it in. So that's what they do. Uh, before we go there, I'm just going to give you a little taste of who Tim Lewis is. One more time, this is from the lead of the story. One more time, the two old friends are back at the rock. They've known each other for nearly 50 years, met in seventh grade, soon became best friends, and laughed their way through high school. Along the way, besides rivers and atop buttes, they pushed each other to run faster and farther. Their nicknames, Legs, who grew to be 6'4", and Mildew, whose shoes would reek after a soggy run in their hometown of Eugene, Oregon. On this spring afternoon in 2014, Leg sits on the curb of Skyline Boulevard, a short drive from the University of Oregon campus. Mildew sits in a wheelchair on the side of the road. The pair are partly shaded by oak trees that rise above the large basalt rock. They're drinking Rolling Rock and remembering the hijinks that sealed their friendship, which had ebbs and flows but eventually brought them here. The stories include the time when they were 16 and impulsively grabbed their bikes and rode to Crater Lake and back, some 300 miles round trip. They laugh anew at how Mildew used to crack up his cross-country friends uh, with his deadpan impression of Flipper, the dolphin's high-pitched squeal. And then there's a time. So the, the lead begins and kind of tells more stories about these two guys. Um, we go back to the rock in the present day. Every now and then, Lewis takes his friend back to the rock on Skyline. It's called Spree's Rock. The two are like so many people who come to, to spot where Prefontaine, America's most competitive, colorful, and revered runner, crashed his car and died one night in 1975. The visitors would come every day, leaving notes, t-shirts, and racing bibs staring at the rock inscribed with, with, by hand with pre 53075 RIP. On this afternoon, a middle-aged man and his daughter approach. They glance at the mementos, and the, and the dad tells the girl a bit about pre. Then Lewis interrupts and points out something to them, an eight-inch high bronze statue affixed to the rock, its weather-worn patina nearly matching the gray stone. It's a picture of pre with his inimitable mustache, his Oregon racing shirt, and his left arm aloft bent at the elbow. He looks like he's running, pumping, about to race off the rock and down Skyline to the nearby track that he once packed with spectators. As the man and his daughter take it in, Lewis points to his friend in the wheelchair, John Mildew Miller. That's the man who made it, he says. Then the two old friends tell the father and daughter their favorite story, the one only a few have ever heard. So that's how this, my piece begins. We get some more backstory, his life. Um, here's a little story about how Tim and John decided to put this baby into the rock. Just as Miller was about to insert the statue's spikes into the holes, a Skyline resident spotted them. The two held their breath. What are you guys up to, he asked. Lewis stuttered out. He's putting the statue pre into the rock. For a moment, the man said nothing. Finally, he responded, wow, cool. Need a hand? Miller and Lewis looked at each other. No, we're good, said Miller. He turned back to the job. Within 15 minutes, pre was in the rock, and according to Lewis, never coming out. John knew what he was doing without epoxy. They pulled out a six-pack of Rolling Rock and sat down on the curb and toasted their hero. And that's how the rock got into the rock. Um, finally, the piece ends um, with this little scene of, of Tim. So Tim and I um, spent a couple of hours sitting at Pree's Rock um, um, talking and hearing Tom, uh, Tim's stories. Um, people would come by. Um, it, was just, it was a beautiful morning for me and, and such because it, it just filled in so many holes. Um, and this is how I, I, I pretty much close out the piece. 
On this day, moss and wild blackberries grow on the rock, and there seems to be a larger than normal collection of notes and bibs left by fans. Lewis takes a sip of his rolling rock and pours the last few ounces on the stone. This was John's legacy, he says, this statue of his hero. He pauses. John might not have become an artist, or maybe all the things he dreamed of becoming, but who does? Um, and in a way, that does sum up John, that he was just like so many of us. He wasn't a celebrity. He never got to run his fastest parade, but he made the pursuit of it part of it. Um, he never got to be a well-known artist, but man, for the people who come to Pre's Rock every day, his legacy lives on. Um, so he did, like, in a way, get his dreams. Um, later in life, he remarried to Rochelle, and he had a son. And that son, I thought, was pretty ironic, because John finished his fifth, I think I mentioned, in the state high school cross-country championships. His son finished his fifth in the state golf championships um, in, a, in a credible mirror. Um, so uh, that's, how, um, that's how the story closes. But I didn't want to finish today's speech on Tim. I'm sorry, Tim. I want to give you one more, one more person. Um, Rochelle, I asked, uh, sh she couldn't come today, but um, this is her last words to John. On September 27, 2015, around 7 p.m., Rochelle went to check in on her husband. For days, he'd been in bed, mostly sleeping and no longer talking. She saw him breathing erratically. She bent down to him and said, John, you've had a good fight. We'll be all right. Go see your mom. Go see your dad. Then she whispered, go see Pri. We'll be fine. He died moments later at age 59. Um, that's Pri, and that's John Miller. The mustaches are uncanny. Uh, uh, thank you very much for listening. What, what a powerful story about someone's life and you know, friendship, sportsmanship, and, and beyond. Right? Yes. So, okay, great. Any questions? Charlie? Please. <laughs> well, all about John. <laughs> well, again, I just want to thank Tim and Don for coming, Elizabeth, yeah, for, that's for all your, your help. Hey, you, want, you want to share some? Your well, story I would just or? like to really thank Charlie for, you know, for doing this story and, and remembering John and stuff. And, uh, and uh, it's it's hard to remember. It's pretty emotional and everything. But uh, I really appreciate that you stuck with it. And, uh, did a great story. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Shane and Seth. Shane, Shane. Are you fine? Oh, Seth. That's the story behind the so <coughs> the memorial that's there. Kind of the main, you know, monument there for free. When did when was that put in, or when did it kind of become this? gathering place with yeah, all the various that, artifacts and things, or, you know, the mementos. I don't know if there's an exact moment set, but it's been that way for a while. But the memorial, memorial came, so John's statue goes up in 91, 92. Um, the memorial actually came years later. Um, and I think it was just the city finally said we should do something. You know, Tim and Don, you might know better. Um, so the statue was there long before. It was at least, else. you know, several years before, yeah. I always thought it was really cool, just the statue itself is because it's so subtle and it's matched the moss and the rock and and then someone actually even before the plaque that's there now, the big one, somebody put up a wooden pre. This looked really horrible. It's all painted white. <laughs> <laughs> but I just the subtleness and the beauty of just the bronze statue was really cool. And I think almost, you know, it's cool to see a picture of Pre on that that slab of marble and everything, but but uh, back in the day when it was just John's bronze statue and the moss and the rawness of the rock and the natural spot, and it, to me, really beautiful. John wanted it to be, um, I being his older brother, uh, he wanted it to be to show everybody that Pre still lives on. And that was the concept behind having that statue in the wall there that this is where it and where it bodily it was there, but his story and everything that surrounds him was still going on, and that was Pre's Rock and Pre's event, and he, that was a way of maintaining that legacy. I want to say that also the thing came about kind of after the movies and when the Pre Fontaine classic started, kind of took that next level, and you could probably say better like that when it kind of went from being kind of a regional race to like a national race that's when the 
the effort was put into kind of promoting that as yeah. a destination. I was wondering kind of when did people start? I mean, obviously, you know, you, you guys would go up to the, before the statue was there, you know, recognize what it was, and this was pretty rock, but were other people sort of people, making people, visits? They were, this was pretty they were okay. continuous. Before. Yeah. I mean, it was just an immediate draw. I mean, I was in the Army when Pre died and stuff, and I was all alone, and I know that people were going to that rock, you know, days after. If I was in Germany, I would have gone. You know, and mm -hmm. uh, I just think it just was a natural mm -hmm. migration to a place where, you know, the last one. So. so, Charlie, what would be your next chapter of this wonderful story? That's a, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> I don't know if there is a book. I, I think there is a book, though. You know, in a sense that th there's so many stories about North Eugene High School, in a sense, which is, again, like every high school in America, but it's Can not like Kenny Moore. I mean, there's, so, there's, there's such a rich running, and everybody knows Eugene as a running town, so that's, that's not new, but I think if you come here as a, as a track fan, but if you've lived here, um, there's something um, special about it that you can't compare to if you're just a track fan who, who sh you know, shows up every four years for the trials. And so I'm not sure if there's a book, but there's, just, there's something, I think, even more. That's great, yeah. Oh, I, I just, uh, the other thing is, I think it's interesting, I don't know if it's, I, I think I've seen both the movies and that fire on the track thing. And I forget which one of them kind of focused on it, but one of them focused on how he kind of transcended running and got into, like, he was one of the first sports, like, athlete, um, you know, promote, you know, like, more than just a thing. And, and then that kind of dovetails into a little bit into Nike and right. not wanting to take the money and how they get, you know, like, so I when, think there's something. Okay. Well, 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 with Pre, I mean, also, you got to remember the AAU was happening at that right. time. He was living in a trailer eating canned goods and working at a bar to mm -hmm. exist. Right. And when they asked him if he's going to win the gold for America, he goes, no. Mm -hmm. This ain't for America or the flag or mom and apple pie. For This is Steve Prefontaine. I'm the one who put the effort into it. <laughs> you know, it's for me. <laughs> you know, and so there was a quote that he, he would say in the past that even certain periods of time when he was still alive before the Olympics, people were really upset with him and everything because he took such a strong stance. And, and, uh, and those are quotes that you never see anymore from Nike or anything like that. You know, they don't, you know, they don't work, you know. But uh, it, was, it was like all league stuff. Uh, he, was, he was out there talking stuff like all league. Um, about all the, the difficulties that all these amateur athletes had to put up with um, and train. And, uh, and so I, I found that, as, as a young runner and stuff, really intriguing. Yeah. And, uh, and sort of the, the James Dean, if you're looking for another term. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I was thinking, Ali, you know, when you were saying Jordan, so he was really the Ali of the running world and of that time period. He yeah. was, like I said, as outspoken as he mm -hmm. was in town, yeah. yeah, yeah, just, just. So, um, I mean, it sounds like that's probably the reason why. But like, when you think about why people are so fascinated with him, you know, there's probably multiple things. And you kind of hinted at it, but what do you think it is? Um, well, I think if you're 17 or 18 right now. You see the T-shirts and you get intrigued, and then you find the story. This guy loved to just run fast and, and furious. Um, he dies young, you know. It's it's a tragic, but it's it's part of the ethos. And but um, he he was good too. I mean, uh, again, I didn't I wasn't a runner growing up, but you read enough about him, like wow, I would be inspired as a 16 year old to not necessarily live the life because you know he obviously had his foibles along the way, but it, on the track, you know, that's fun to do. You know? And you know, if you ever have a chance to watch the 72 Olympic race and see what he did and could have done and then what he screwed up doing, um, you know, but still, you know, that was his style. And uh, I think that builds it. You know, losing, not even meddling at the Olympics, I think heightened his, his persona. Oh, I just want to give a shout out to uh, appreciate, I know Runner's World made to do fact checking, but um, when things get elevated to this level of mythology like this, especially people that actual people living still remember, <coughs> when Kenny Moore wrote, um, or he contributed to the screenplay for Without Limits, and so it was his memory of the memorial service that's depicted in that film that gave us that Bowerman quote, yeah. um, and he had never seen that film clip until a couple of weeks ago oh, himself, really? 
and he hadn't seen the transcript of Barrowman's speech, so he was recreating it from his own memory as uh, being what it was. And so um, I'm just, I appreciate that kind of documentation um, just to help keep our facts straight right as now. things you know, proliferate on the internet, especially around a figure like this yes. that is so charismatic and so inspiring. Definitely. No, again, it, I can't wait till the summer comes and just hang out in your offices. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I would just like to mention, just part of history, living history still, is like you talk about pre and dying young, and there's that sort of you know, mystique <laughs> because of that, whether it's changing or whoever, you know, and everything. And just to be a runner, at that time, in the late 60s and early 70s, um, and going to every single meet at Hayward Field, and John and all our running buddies, we set up hurdles there, so we were always on the infield, you know, um, for the 72 Olympic trials and stuff, and so to watch Pre up close and personal, and the kind of inspiration that would give you as a distance runner, you would go out for 10 to 15 mile runs immediately following. We probably improved our mile times by 10 seconds, you know, <laughs> because just because of pre, and we wanted to be like pre. We wanted that grit. And so that inspiration that that cat gave us at that time, um, Eugene was a mecca of high school runner. South Eugene had 35 runners under five minutes. You know, wow. I ran a 427 mile, and I was eighth on the team. <laughs> you know, and, and it was insane. And because of Pre and the influence that it gave the local runners, especially in Eugene, um, uh, just that motivation of who he was. Yeah. And, uh, and so that was an incredible time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, one last question. If we don't have, we have learned that history matters. Thank you so much, Charlie. Thank you. Thank you.